I grew up in a house where there were a lot of books. Both my parents uh, left school early. My dad left school when he was 13. He's from France Street in the Liberties, very proud of his Dublin heritage. And they didn't have much in the way of formal education, either of my parents, but they had a genuine, deep, um, abiding love of the arts and the genuine respect for uh, all of that patrimony that we in Ireland have. I think they had a very deep sense that this little country on the Western outposts of Europe hadn't done everything right, hadn't done, uh, hadn't achieved success in every area. Um, and there was political failure and there was the North of Ireland and there was um, emigration, all of that. Mm. But I, they took pride in the fact that the greatest poet of the 20th century, uh, Yeats, had walked the same streets as us, and that James Joyce had been from Dublin, and Shaw had been from Dalkey, near Dunleary, where I grew up. And they handed that on, certainly to me, um, with, with a sense of lightness. I mean, they, they felt, this is not homework. This is something that you can be really proud of. And you should probably know a bit about Wilde and Singh and Lady Gregory, because uh, you'd be a richer person if you did. Um, so, as I say, there were there were hundreds of books in the house. I remember old Pooh Bed Press paperbacks of mm -hmm. Julia O'Fallon and Frank O'Connor and the great Irish short story writers. And then, when I, in the middle of my teens, I started to read a bit more widely and to have that not hunger, but curiosity, that wondering, could I ever do that myself? Hmm. Um, and then when I was 17, I read a copy of a great American novel, The Catcher in the Rye by J.D. Yeah. Salinger, a great novel of teenage life. Oh. And I could probably date it if I thought carefully enough about it, Joe, but I can remember turning the last page of that novel in my bedroom in Arnold Grove, Glenageary near Dunleary and thinking that's what I would like to do with my life and mm -hmm. um, that was the book that finally turned the key yes. for me and I can remember thinking I might succeed I might fail I don't care <laughs> I want to be like J.D. Salinger I want to be like John McGahern mm -hmm. uh, I want to spend my time trying to do that and a lovely thing about Ireland you know and I've come to really value this as my own career has gone on and as I've traveled to other countries, there really was a sense, and I think there still is among Irish people who are parents, for example, that to have a child who wants to work in the arts is, uh, is a special thing and a good thing, something you would be proud of. You know, and not everybody feels that. I remember when I was at Oxford, I went to Oxford for a year after UCD, a very nice man who was a ma the master of the college an American scholar, and the tradition was all of the PhD students would go and have tea with the master mm. Um, mm. once a term, and I went along, we had a chat, he said, so what are you going to do with your life after you leave here? I said, well, I'm hoping to write, and he said, don't you mind that you'll be living out of a can of beans for the rest of your life? <laughs> and because I was young, of course, I didn't mind. Um, so he, he thought it a strange thing, but I think a lot of Irish people would think it you know, an interesting thing and a part of the tapestry of Irish life that is special and worth celebrating and that if you have a child who wants to make their own minuscule contribution to, to literature or, or the arts, you know, that they would be encouraged. Beautiful, beautiful. And, and that's, that's a beautiful answer. Thank you very, very, thank you very much for that. And, and you just spoke about your teenage years and I know that you went to school in, in Blackrock College, a place that seems to produce a plethora of writers. And I'm thinking of people like Paul Murray and, and, uh, and Paul Howard, Kevin Power, indeed Flann O'Brien, if we go back a little bit. Was there something about, about that education, about, about that place? Is there something about religious? I, what, what, what is that? How did that all? I, I, I have to say, uh, you know, Blackrock College has has been in and out of favour over the years. Uh, my great hero, um, Sir Bob Geldof of the yeah. Moon Rats, went to Blackrock College and yeah. didn't yeah. like it very much. Um, my experience there was largely wonderful. Um, the school is, uh, you know, it's it exists for the promotion of rugby first. Yeah. 
and then Catholicism second, but a rather gentle, inclusive form of Catholicism. And um, at the same time, they always had a great <clears throat> sense that misfits should be tolerated. People like okay. myself who weren't interested okay. in rugby okay. um, and who, who liked to go into town on the bus and look at paintings in the National yeah. Gallery or who liked to listen to punk rock uh, or who, who liked writing short stories. Yes. Yeah, sure, they're just the hapless poor Egypts. And they, they, I think the priests were baffled by the fact that you didn't love rugby as much as they did. Um, but I never felt any anything other than uh, tolerance and gentleness um, around it. Now, other people's experience of the school would have been different. And certainly we all know of the horror stories mm -hmm. um, that have been too many, that have been legion about uh, Irish schools run by religious orders. I can only tell you that my own experience was that they were um, generally uh, gentle, rather eccentric, mm. rather worldly men. Mm. I mean, a lot of them, it was, a, it was what used to be called a missionary order. So a lot of these men had lived in South uh, America, had lived in Africa, mm. and had seen stuff that people in South County Dublin hadn't seen. Mm. So they had some sense of that. That's all I would say. They weren't um, right. political radicals. Right. And they, they saw the lens but they saw the world obviously through the lens of their religious uh, belief system. But right. I, I found them um, inclusive, rather mild, uh, sometimes very interesting men. Mm -hmm. I mean, the occasional header, but uh, I, I remember most of them with enormous uh, affection. You said political radical. I know that Mike wants to ask you some questions actually about your time as a journalist, Neres, but, but you were a bit of a political radical yourself. And I'm thinking back of, of those times in the mid 1980s when, when, when Ireland, or unusual parts of Ireland, became fascinated almost by the Sandinista movement and by Nicaragua and that. And you, you were one of those. I think you actually went to Nicaragua. Mm, yeah. No, I mean, I think for, for people of my age, um, yeah. I was born in 1963, so I, I sometimes think for people of my age, Nicaragua was uh, what Spain was to people in the 1930s. Um, but Nicaragua was a place where uh, there had been a revolution. It right. appeared at the time not to have been widespread um, human rights abuses. There wasn't a policy of execution. The revolution had been a genuine popular front. Women's groups, the church, artists, the trade unions, everybody had been involved in chucking out this brute, um, mm. Somoza and his uh, regime. And new things were happening there. Mm. And they seemed to kind of seep into the new things that were happening in Britain and Ireland. The Clash, a great punk rock band who I loved, had a triple mm. album called Sandinista. Um, <laughs> Our current president, uh, President Higgins, for whom I have enormous affection and respect, um, was one of the uh, UN observers of the first free election um, in Nicaragua. So I always was interested in it. And when we went to the Belfield Bar, the university bar, you know, on a Friday night as first years, we would all get drunk and say we would go to Nicaragua one day uh, with absolutely no intention of going. Um, and then in February 1985, my mother died in a car crash. And whatever way, I mean, grief affects people in, in different ways. And there was plenty of support offered to me and plenty of friendship and, and people willing to listen. But the way it affected me, Joe, was um, I just I wanted to go somewhere where I didn't know anyone. I wanted to be by myself. I wanted to process what had been a very difficult family situation. Um, somewhere where I wouldn't have to talk to anyone at all. So those two things came together, and, and she, she died in, on February the 10th, 1985, and on the 1st of June, uh, I went to Nicaragua. And it was a very formative experience, and it's, 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 it's so long ago, but I would say I rarely have a week when I don't think about that trip. Mm -hmm. I dream about it. I, I remember it with the, the sort of vivid colours uh, with which we remember youth and it was it was a big part of my life and I, I wrote a novel about it eventually my second novel 
uh, desperados is set in Nicaragua. Indeed, and that astonishing, that astonishing meeting of, of, of grief and idealism, the idealism of youth and a grief that comes too soon, of course, as it always does to everybody. I said, of course, it had to affect your life. Right? Mike, did you want? To, did you want to ask some questions there? You were wondering about some things. Yeah, I mean, I'll see, I'll see anybody else. Please do type in your questions, and uh, we can answer them as we go along. But I'll see, Joe. I mean, the one thing working as a historian, I I first started coming over here in the mid eighties, and your books were everywhere, and your journalism was everywhere, and. I found them side-splittingly funny. I find them observant of, the, of a country I was entering. But I keep going back to them over the years. Um, in terms, tr as a historian, trying to understand that journey that Ireland went on, which kind of mirrors the period of your schooling, graduation, return from Nicaragua, etc., that you, you do journey through pre- and post-Celtic tiger. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, where you worked... It, um, you wrote that wonderful piece about the kind of IDA adverts where, the, you know, we are the young Europeans, but they all emigrate. Mm -hmm. um, and la But later on, you're then dealing with, in a way, some of that kind of crass wealth of the Celtic tiger years. So two questions in a way. How did you find that whole experience? As you say, you grow up in a house surrounded by literature and that kind of maybe very powerful but older view of Ireland. And then suddenly, you know, 10, 15 years later, you're in, bright, shiny, minted Dublin. Mm. Um, but also, how did you also, as a writer, find that experience of just producing that level of journalism, clearly to pay the bills, I presume, um, but just as learning to be a writer, was it that constant demand for material? Did that kind of push you? Is that the great kind of learning school to be in when you, at some future point, have a novel in your head? Well, I mean, I, I, I loved being a journalist, and I mean, as I was saying to Joe earlier, you know, when I was 17 or 18, I, I suddenly woke up one morning with this ambition to be a writer. But surprisingly enough, there weren't a lot of role models in Ireland at that time. Mm. I mean, it seems really odd now when every town and village in Ireland has its own literary festival and um, there are readings in bookstores right. every night of the week. And the Arts Council does so much for writers and all of that but I didn't really know of many writers there was one living Irish writer who, who was in our hood and um, the late great Hugh Leonard and he lived in a spectacular beautiful house on um, yeah. Bico Road in Dorky and he had a he had a Rolls Royce and uh, I remember once during Bob a job week when Boy Scouts go around looking for jobs to do in people's houses I <laughs> I cleaned Hugh Leonard's Rolls Royce and I thought, geez, if I become a writer, maybe I will have a Rolls Royce one day. But more realistically, I thought that's not going to happen. So what would a job be where I could use words? What would a job be where I could write a lot? So in UCD, you know, in the summer of first year and second year, when my buddies would be going off to Europe to make money working in the Volkswagen factory in Germany or working on the buildings in England, uh, I got work at the Sunday Tribune uh, in Dublin, which had then just been formed by Vincent Brown. I worked at McGill magazine. Mm -hmm. And it was the most extraordinary apprenticeship because I was just a young fella with... Um, very wide-eyed about writing and journalism. You'd go into the McGill office, which was uh, in a room over O'Donoghue's pub on Merrion Row, and some of the great writers of our time would be sitting there working. I mean, literally, um, Colm Tobin might be in one corner, Fintan O'Toole might be in another, um, Jean Kerrigan was, was a, a regular, Nell McCafferty, whose work I, I love, um, pe people who were just an, an amazing combination of being brilliant reporters and brilliant writers. And that is very rare. And I loved being around them. And it was a fascinating time to know journalists uh, in Ireland. I, I, I can never understand journalists' reputation for sort of alcoholic laziness, because I just found them so hardworking, so determined to get the story out. And I suppose it was the beginnings Joe, of the notion that the media in Ireland should call power to account. Yeah. Um, like when I was a kid, and you remember this, 
Mike, and you'll know this from your scholarship, but the media in Ireland didn't pretend to be objective. I mean, the Irish press group was there to promote Fianna Fáil and the independent papers were there to promote Fianna Gael, and that's the way it was. People thought that's probably the way it should be. Um, but when Hibernia and McGill and the Tribune and in Dublin and Hot Press came along, there's mm. this generation of new, very restless journalists who said, no, these are not the stories that need to be told. Um, these are the stories. This is what we're going to do. And to be around that as an 18 year old kid was just mm. fantastic. And then I must say, uh, in terms of discipline, uh, like every novelist should have an apprenticeship as a journalist, mm -hmm. because it means you, you can't sit around waiting for the muse to, mm -hmm. to come on, you know, knock on your windows. If you're writing a column for a weekly newspaper and it's due on a Wednesday afternoon at five o'clock, it better come in a, a Wednesday afternoon at five o'clock or you don't get paid. Mm -hmm. And it's a thousand words. So it doesn't matter if you've written 1200 words of the most beautiful prose since Scott Fitzgerald somebody's going to get a scissors literally in those days and cut off the last 200. So it's very good for your style. It's very good for your discipline. And, uh, and it, was, it was good to be part of something that felt like a sort of revolution uh, in Ireland. Mm -hmm.